Okay, let's get cracking then. So in your exercise books, please, let's uh, take a page. Today we're going to move on to the new topic. Whoops, didn't have that in the correct position. So today we're going to move on to the new topic for the day, which is the accelerator. But before we do that, what we're just going to do briefly is we're going to run through the multiplier, just refresh our memories on the multiplier. So, first off, Ellie, what's the abbreviation for the multiplier? K. Okay. So, the multiplier K states that. Jonathan, the multiplier K states that. Okay, if you inject money into the economy, you'll get more out. So if you inject £10 into the economy... And when you say get more out, what do you mean specifically? So if there's an injection of £10... Measured by... How do we measure that? Change in GDP or the change in national income. Okay, so the multiplier states that an injection whatever the value of that injection, will lead to a greater rise in national income. Yes? Okay. So, a change in... And what's the abbreviation for an injection? J. J. Right. Good. So, a change... Whatever the injection is, that then leads to a greater... Change in national income, which of course is why. <laughs> now, can that change in the injection, can that be an increase and a decrease, or does it just work in the one direction, Saffron? It, it goes in both directions, okay, so we can have an increase in J leading to a greater rise in y, so it's working in a positive direction, but of course let's not forget that it also works in a negative direction, so if you get a reduction in said injection, or I suppose you know a withdrawal in that respect, then again that will be working in a downwards direction. And that of course is called a, thank you, a negative multiplier, precisely. And these are the means by which, when we're talking about our discussions of the interaction of AD and AS, and all the way through your GCSE studies, and all the way until we've more recently talked about the multiplier, we always said, oh, the AD curve shifts to the right. But now when we're describing the interaction of AS and AD, Ellie, we will always say that AD shifts to the right but we will always, always include reference to the multiplier process. So we'll say AD shifts to the right via this multiplier process. So when you're doing your ASAD diagrams, whatever they may be, and you're talking about shifts, so AD1 whoops, goes to AD2, You get this increase in the level of national income or real GD, real output, real GDP. Well, we're saying that that is as a consequence of this multiplier process. Okay, can we then have a few equations just to remind ourselves, Jonathan? Say that again. Okay, so put that in the proper... Thank you. Okay, so change in Y, delta Y, the change in national income divided by the change in the injection, correct. 
or sometimes you might say it as delta Y over delta E, change in expenditure. So that's one way of calculating it. Okay, another way with reference to MPC, Megan. One minus no. One over Thank you. K is equal to one over one minus MPC. And so from what is the MPC there? Marginal propensity to consume. Now that is the same as saying one over MPS. Thank you. Marginal propensity to save. Because remember, in our closed economy, we assume that we either consume or we save. So it's one or the other. So 1 minus MPC is just the same as 1 over MPS. And then in the more broader sense, in the open economy, where we've got imports and taxation and savings, one way of saying it would be 1 over... So if you grouped all those things together, they would be called... Savings, tax, imports, Ali, they're all called withdrawals. So, Alana, the open economy multiplier. Uh, one over the marginal propensity to save, marginal propensity tax, and marginal propensity to Okay, so, and grouping them all together, you could call that. One over the withdrawals. And marginal propensity to withdraw, okay, which is, ex it's, is the same as one over. As your learned colleague Alan has just pointed out, so you could say it's the MPS plus the MPM plus the MPT. So adding all of those withdrawals together. Now, why is it important to know those equations? Well, when are you most likely to, in, are you, I mean, you're going to get an essay in your exam saying, please uh, evaluate the multiplier equations. So why do you need to know them? Right, correct. Multiple choice questions. On which paper? Three. three. Paper three. How many? 30. Thirty. Remember, it's out of 80. So your data questions and all is 50, and then your multi choices are, are 30. Uh, and where should you be uh, going to practice those? Shout out here. Where should you be going to practice them? Quanti uh, no, not quantitative skills, but there's some, another place that you can go to. Where have I directed you to for your quantitative skills? Tutor to you. Tutor to you. Have you checked on Tutor to you for multiple choice questions? Okay. So you've got your international board, past papers, difficult questions, but if you can do those, these ones should be relatively straightforward. Tutor to you, I had a look last week, they've got 100 multiple choice split into micro and macro, so they've got 50 micro and 50 macro, so it'd be another great place to go for um, practice papers. Then obviously you've got your um, past papers, I know there aren't many, but there are one or two, and there are also the sample assessment materials that you can be using as well. Right, okay, so that's the multiplier works upwards and downwards, these are the equations, and we use it to uh, show, or to kind of explain why AD shifts to the right. So, now we're going to just kind of complete the circle, if you will, because the multiplier then interacts with the accelerator. So, which is why in your textbook, uh, the chapter is called, I believe, the multiplier and the accelerator, or the topic heading. Uh, Ellie, what chapter is that? 21. Chapter 21, right. So chapter 21 in our textbook is the multiplier and the accelerator. So in previous lessons, we've obviously spelt, spent a lot of time having a look at the multiplier. Now let's have a look at the accelerator. Oh, yes. So we had, an, uh, we had a, a message around yesterday to say that we're not to use these, uh, what do you call those? Yes, on the board. So I managed to dig out some of the uh, whiteboard cleaner, which is tip top.
Right. Okay. So just thinking about this um, accelerator theory then for a moment. The accelerator is to do with which component of AD, Ellie? It's to do with the investment component. Okay. So, and we talked about yesterday, we were referencing David Smith, as we often do in class. And we were talking about David Smith. And David Smith, in his most recent article, was talking about productivity. And I think it was Alana who pointed out that correct answer in the multiple choice question which I set you. And David Smith was saying, what are the four key elements to long run economic growth as we were discussing yesterday? And Megan, the four key elements were? to long-run economic growth and improvements in productivity. Shifting okay, but, so that's the effect. What, what, what were the four causes cited in the multiple choice? <coughs> more innovation. Come on, we, we only made these notes yesterday. More innovation. More investment. More ra ra infra infrastructure and technology. Uh, technology right so innovation technology investment infrastructure correct okay so it's the accelerator theory of investment and we know that investment is a component of AD, C to the I to the G to the X minus M. And A, that, that's of course is equal to AD as I've just mentioned. We've also just established, Megan, that not only does investment increase AD, but it will also shift supply, leading to, as we discussed yesterday, in terms of economic growth, sustainable, sustainable economic growth and in long run economic growth. Okay. And what did we say we meant by that word sustainable, just out of interest? Um, like you can keep it up without yeah, you can grow your economy, your Y component, but not have that kind of upside inflationary pressures, correct. So investment clearly impacts A D and it also impacts AS. Now what would be, if, say every year, a firm like Nissan, for example, the most efficient car plant in the whole of Europe, on our doorstep. Um, I was just reading this morning, actually, just as a little aside here with regard to the, um, the car manufacturing industry on the Financial Times this morning. I have written to Sebastian Payne, by the way, Alana, so hopefully we'll be hearing from him soon. But I was reading on the Financial Times this morning uh, where... Are minis made in this country? Do you know? BMW Mini. So they're made in Oxford. Um, but the Mini Clubman, which you may be familiar with, sort of the estate, kind of long, one with the long boot on it, that is made in the Netherlands. And Mini have just announced this morning that from 2024, they're going to cease production of the Mini in the Netherlands. And so hopes are now up in Oxford because... They've got a plant there, and they're hoping that they'll maybe shift the production of the Mini Clubman to Oxford, which kind of for long-term job prospects will be, will be a good thing. But coming back then to, to Nissan, what, what, will ha what would happen over the course of 365 days of the year? Um, we know that it's a, an automated plant. The machines are working 24-7, apart from the two-week shutdown that they have usually for the summer. So in normal circumstances, kind of not pandemic, what would happen to the machinery over the course of a year? Right, thank you. So the machinery, and I, I'm talking about machinery because, of course, by investment, Ellie, the I component, we really mean investment by firms in capital goods, yes by firms in capital. So over the course of the year, as our learned colleague, uh, Mr. Marins just pointed out, that machinery will wear out um, and it will become depleted. 
And so what will Nissan have to do at the end of the year? Okay, so they need to set aside a certain amount of money to replace worn out machinery. So one of the reasons why firms will have to invest in the first place is simply they need to replace or repair or both machinery which is wearing out. Worn. Is it, oh, has that got an E on the end of it, Alana? In the English uh, guru here. Worn. Worn, yeah, worn out. No, just W O R. Okay, thank you. The online dictionary. Worn out machinery. Okie dokie. And what else might they need? So that's one reason. We do that here at college. So There's kind of a. a, a a budget for replacing worn out capital equipment, things that might wear out. And that is also known as when things wear out, your machines are said to be doing what? And it happens to cars as soon as you drive them off the forecourt, but it's the same term. Depreciation. Depreciation. Thank you. So machinery, which is worn out, you would say that you've got some sort of depreciation budget in order to bring that to bring that stock of equipment on day 365, you need a budget which will kind of get it back to the state it was in on day one of the year. So that's one reason why firms will need to invest. But the, probably the second and the more important point would be what? So if this is one, what's two? Why, why, why else would firms need to invest, Ellie? Okay, and, and the, so uh, to invest in new technology in order to do what? For, to become more productive. So in order to improve the firm's productive capacity or potential, correct. So firms will need to invest in order to increase the productive potential stroke capacity and what would that do LA to the position of a PPC for example it would shift it outwards so you could show that as we talked about yesterday so your long-run economic growth PPC is shifting outwards or so from what would it do to your LRAS curve So if you had a CAS, it would go... No, no, so it would remain in elastic, but it would go... It would shift to the right. And if you had a kind of your Keynesian one, Jonathan, it would also move in out in this direction. And if you had kind of your standard AS, like so, it would shift to the right. Okay, so all of those things are basically showing the same thing, the increase in the productive potential or the capacity of the firm. Okay, now let's then have a little think about aggregate demand. So at the moment, let's take Nissan as a great example on our doorstep. At the moment, would and given the current economic climate, would Nissan be doing lots of number two? Why not? Okay, so our learned colleague, uh, Mr. JM, has said that they will not be uh, increasing their productive capacity by investing in new plant and new machinery and new technology, as Ellie has pointed out, because The demand's not there. And what about, say, six, 12 months down the line? What's, how's the future looking? What? Bleak. Okay, come on. You, you're not listening to assembly this morning. We're trying to be positive. But yes, you're right. Bleak. Okay. So how would you then, if you were to describe the expectations of the motor manufacturing industry, what would you say their expectations are at the moment? 
roast. Yes, you so Blake. Um, Possibly not that encouraging at the moment. Yeah, they'll be looking ahead and they think their expectations of the future, particularly with regard to demand, will be fairly weak demand, you would say. Bleak and weak. Yes. Okay. So would that mean that they wouldn't do any of this as well? Okay, so they might still have to replace the worn out stuff, but looking to the future, they're, pr they're probably not going to be doing much of this. Okay. Well, they might, but let's not forget how expensive it would be and how expensive some of the... I don't know if you were ever on the visits that we did to Nissan, but... That some of the, I mean, you're talking several millions of pounds for some of the equipment that's down there. So it would be a kind of risky thing probably to do at the minute. So do you think, therefore, that investment depends upon the economic cycle? Yes. Ellie, do you think so? Yeah. Ellie thinks so. Okay. What about Alana? Do you think so? Sorry? Kind of, yeah. Kind of? Why kind of? Because there's probably other factors, but like if, if you are in a massive recession, then you're not going to want to invest much. Okay. So when do you think, if we were talking about the economic cycle, the, the, when do you think you w firms would be investing a lot? In a boom. Okay, or in the, certainly in the run-up to that point. Correct. Okay. So let's get a diagram down for the economic cycle. Let's just mention that. <coughs> right. So what do we have on the x-axis here, Ellie? Time. Thank you. And you can have economic activity or just GDP here. And the peaks are referred to, Megan, as booms. And the troughs. And the in-betweens. So you've got a, this in-between here, what would you call that? So you're going from reset, so you're going from the, the trough back to another boom time. Okay, but in... That, I mean, you, I guess you could describe it as that, but in our kind of uh, annotations of the economic cycle diagram, we would call it the recovery phase. And what would we call this kind of movement from the, the boom, then we're going down into the recession, so you'd call that the... <laughs> Certainly is, yeah, damage, absolutely. Um, but what would what would you say is happening to? No, no. Ec that is called the economic slowdown. <coughs> so we've got booms, recessions, recoveries, and slowdowns. All right, well, can I, let's concentrate on this, please. Now, as with all of these diagrams, the general trend that we try to illustrate is what, Jonathan? It, so if you were to put a kind of trend line through there, like so, <coughs> the general trend is usually upwards, obviously. Do governments want, or and do central banks want these big deviations away from trend, Megan? Why not? Yeah, and so, and what problems do booms bring? Right. Okay. 
<coughs> what problems do recessions bring? Unemployment. And what happens to the amount of unemployment benefit paid, um, Ellie, in the in the recession? It increases, so so it's called what? Transfer payments are referred to as what? What type of payments they're said to be? Because when you're in a recession, the amount of unemployment benefits, Social Security is going up. So the economy is going down, and these payments then go up. So they're called counter-cyclical. We mentioned this before. Transfer payments are said to be counter-cyclical. <coughs> so universal credit and all of these things, they are counter-cyclical. In other words, they're going counter to the direction of the economic cycle. So when the, when the economic cycle is going down, these payments are going up. Whereas when we're in a boom, what happens to the number of people on unemployment, uh, benefits and payments of all types? That starts to drop. So the economy is going that way, and these benefits are starting to come the other way. So they're going counter the cycle all the time. And does that happen automatically, Jonathan? Does it happen? Does it happen automatically? I mean, is that not just government policy? And so, therefore, if you become unemployed, you get these payments, and it just happens. Well, regard, regard. So, if you qualify, do you? I mean, it's an automatic thing. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, and th so thus these are called automatic. What stabilizers? So transfer payments. This is a. This is something we have discussed in the past. Transfer payments are said to be countercyclical, i.e. going against the direction of the economic cycle. And because they kind of just kick in as a part of government policy, they're said to be automatic stabilizers. So they're trying to, when you're in recession, they're trying to bring the economy back towards the trend line. Therefore, more money's paid out by the government and unemployment benefit. Whereas when the economy is booming, you want to take the heat out of the economy and so they go in the opposite direction. And just to finish that as a little aside, because it's important that you know this, um, these transfer payments, so you've got that being counter-cyclical. Now the other kind of automatic stabiliser, the second one, Alana, do you know? Uh, Say again. No. Okay, tax is also an automatic stabilizer. Now, Ellie, can you think why? And that then what does that do to the size? So this is where the multiplier is important. So you're absolutely bang on in what you've said. So we know that tax is an what type of variable? No, that's the type of tax system. What type of variable is it? Induced or autonomous? It's, uh, taxes are induced variables, so that's the reason why we, we would draw it like so. So as national income rises, more people have incomes, therefore the amount of tax revenue goes up. So that would be rise in employment and as a consequence you get more tax rate you mean you get more income tax you get more VAT you get more council tax all of these things
And Megan, is tax an injection or a withdrawal? withdrawal. Okay. So this taxation is a withdrawal. And what do withdrawals do to the size of the multiplier? Jonathan. Reduce it. Reduce it. Correct. So withdrawals reduce the value of K. So let's think about then why taxation is an automatic stabilizer. In a recession here, what will happen to the amount of people in employment or the, the size of national income? It will be falling. So rather than being here, for example, the level of Y might be here during the recession. So what happens to the amount of tax taken out of the economy? There's a lot less tax taken out of the economy. So the size of the withdrawal is much smaller. So what happens to the size of the multiplier? It gets bigger. So the multiplier is bigger. Therefore, that means even though there might be fewer people spending in a recession, hopefully it'll help to grow the economy because there's a bigger multiplier. So if this is your level of Y during a recession, it means that tax, the amount of tax coming out of the economy falls. And because tax is a withdrawal, we've got fewer withdrawals. And because there are fewer withdrawals, that means that the value of K is going up. So therefore, any spending that does take place, hopefully, there'll be a bigger multiplier effect. So that will hopefully help dig the economy out of a recession. So you might therefore argue, well, so what, what should maybe uh, Rishi do at the minute? Right. And you might say that could help kind of reinforce this counter-cyclical stabilizing movement and help to push the economy back up to trend. And then if we look then, Megan, to the other side, because you talked about the, so if we're here, why boom times? What's the big problem? Inflation. Right, so inflation. But automatically, by default, as the economy is getting bigger, the amount of tax coming out of the economy is going up. So tax is going up. So that means you have a bigger withdrawal. So that means the multiplier is smaller. So that helps to kind of dampen down those shifts of AD and helps to kind of suppress that upside inflationary pressure. Now, that, none of this is part of the accelerator, but it's very important that you know this whole notion of transfer payments being so-called counter-cyclical. Is that okay, Alana? Oh, I think she's signed off. Yeah, she has, yeah. Right, so do you understand that, Ellie? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Explain, explain it. <laughs> well, just the... Uh, so tell me why... Tell me why... Tell me why... Um, unemployment, Social Security, etc. Why it's an automatic stabiliser? So you get a bit more spending in the economy. And also, when people are spending that unemployment benefit, that is an injection into the economy, correct? Whereas, Ellie, when we've got the, the boom times, you've got 
still talking about unemployment benefit? Okay. So that's helping to reduce that injection into the economy and therefore help kind of dampen down the upside inflationary pressures. So very, very important that counter the cycle. Right, okay, so let's get back then to this whole notion of the accelerator. So we were talking about Nissan, and Jonathan, you, you, sa you said uh, a great thing there. So you talked about expectations. And expectations will have the biggest effect on which of the two uh, types of investment that we described. So it will have the biggest effect on um, replacement, of worn out stuff or will it have the biggest effect on new advances and new innovations which of the two new right okay so the expectations and the accelerator by default and as a consequence expectations have a big impact on the accelerator because this will impact the amount of investment that you're getting in not just replacement technology, but new technology, innovative technology. So if you were CEO of Nissan Sunderland at the moment and you had this diagram in, your, uh, in, your, in the boardroom at Sunderland and you were talking to all your top execs, where on that cycle, economic cycle diagram would you point out to your top execs as being a point at which you think, oh, hey guys, we really need to ramp up this investment in new technology. We need, we, we need to recruit the best in the business to, for these new innovative ideas. Where, whereabouts would that happen? Okay, so let's, so we can scrap the trend line for the time being. So let's, not, so we're just talking about the cycle. Okay, when you've got so an upswing, okay, and um, so what would so to use the the terms that we've used there on the diagram, what would you say? Right, probably yes. So when you see what what do you, what do people refer to the what shoots of recovery? <laughs> the green shoots of recovery. Have you never heard that term before? Okay, so well, it's a it's a very often used term. Whenever you see the green shoots of recovery, that is probably the time at which you as a firm will think, right, we really need to ramp up our investment in new technologies. Green shoots of recovery, it's often used that in the press especially, the green shoots of recovery. Spring has sprung, you know, growth, green shoots. But the key point being recovery. Now, what, why? I mean, what, why would that make you think, right, we need some better technology improved I mean, so what you're in a recovery so what what is it that you're you're expecting to happen okay so you you reckon your trajectory is upwards you're heading towards you know the good days are here again which is you know feel good factor and all that jazz so you think that you're traveling in that direction but so what are you expecting to happen so you're expecting a boom go on what else what other terms could you describe Sorry? Okay, right. So you're expecting changes in AD, yes? Okay, and what, what sort of changes would you expect to happen to AD? 
Okay, what about the rate at which it's going to change? I mean, do you expect it to be significant or minimal? I mean, if it was minimal, you could just say, you could just say to your workers, hey, work those machines a bit harder. So you could probably meet that extra demand. So what is it that you're really expecting? What? <laughs> right, you're expecting AD to just go off like a... Yes! Like a rocket, absolutely. So... If, again, if this is time... And this time, this is G, you know, GDP here, again. And so we're in 2020. So let's say this is 2021. And 2022, 2023, etc. So what, how would you, what, what's going to happen to GDP, say, in the next year? Flat? Or, well, forecasts would say different. Forecasts would say possibly, certainly very, very flat. So the rate of change is very small. Right, okay. Um, 2021 comes and maybe kind of six months into next year, possibly we might get some sort of vaccine. So we're going to be well into sort of digging into the middle to sort of latter couple of quarters of next year, maybe before we get any vaccine. That's going to take time to roll out to the 7 billion in, in the, the world's population. So what about next year? Okay, but again, fairly weak, so I'm just going to keep this going, fairly flat here. So now we're into the beginning of 2022. Everybody's vaccinated, life returns to, no life returns to normal again. We can all go out, we can go to concerts, we can go to restaurants, we can mix with friends, family, etc. Then what happens? People have been saving money for... Months and months and months. They're, they can't wait to get out there. Amazon it can't meet the extra demand. So what's going to happen? Right. And it's going to go off like a... Like a rocket. Okay. And maybe it might go... Shh, like that. We, yeah. Now at that point... The rate of change is very, very significant, isn't it? So you've got a very significant rate of change in GDP growth. And what then will kick in? Because firms need to meet the extra demand, so they need extra capacity. What will kick in? Uh, okay, and, but to do with the very topic, though, that we're looking at, what will kick in? At this point, there will then be an accelerated rate of investment. So th uh, this is when the accelerator kicks in. And what's prompted the accelerator? Not the level of GDP, but the rate of growth of GDP. That is the key thing, precisely. So the accelerator, this is determined by the rate of change in GDP. And it's the rate, right? That is the key thing, the rate of change. Hmm. 
Now, what you must be very clear in your own minds about, again, time, GDP. So the, what we're saying here, it doesn't matter if GDP is like 20 trillion or 1 trillion. If the rate of change is flat, Megan, if the rate of change is flat, you will not get... Right. You will not get an accelerated investment growth. It's only determined by, and it only really is kicked in and kicks in whenever you get this accelerated rate. Because at that point, what's going to go off like a rocket? Not a, What's going to go off like a rocket? Okay, but that's, so that, that's the consequence. But what's caused it? Ex increase in AD. Now, Megan, to come back to the point that you made earlier, we were talking about if AD goes off like a rocket, AD might go up to here. In upside inflationary pressure. Now, in order to keep a lid on that, you are going to have to, as an economy or as a you are going to have to shift your LRAS to the right. And then that becomes what type of growth? And sustainable growth. Correct. So whenever you get this AD going off like a, you know, like an absolute whippet, then as a consequence of that, you, you really need to ramp up your investment because if you don't, you're going to fall foul of this problem, right? Now, that is why there is this kind of uh, circular link, if you will, between the accelerator and the multiplier, which we shall now just dig into. And that, this will kind of conclude our uh, studies of the accelerator. But is that okay up to this point? JM? Yeah. Okay. So just thinking about these two the diagrams that we've done already, let's just have a think about these. So if we were to break these things down into kind of uh, stages here, So what's the first thing that's happened in this diagram here? Or whenever we're getting to the recovery section, what, what happens? Uh, before that. So thinking, thinking specifically about aggregate demand. Yep. Okay. So that would expl so that would explain kind of this flat flatlining part of it, but then okay, the green shoots of recovery, encouraging signs, and as a consequence, what did we say is going to shoot up? But, okay. What? Right. Okay. So we get to this point here. Expectations about the economy are much much more, uh, much greener, much better. And so AD is going to, right. Okay, so point number one, we've got rise in AD. Point two, in response to that, right, okay. So firms invest. Point three, investment is an injection. Injections have what effect on the economy? Talked about at the very start of the lesson. Investments are an injection. A change in injections, whatever its source, causes a change in national income, which is greater than the initial change in the injection. You need to learn that. In 
multiplier effect. Right. So this then has a multiplier effect. Okay, so there's a multiplier effect in the economy. What will that then do to the rate of change of GDP? Right, so you're going to have a very, hopefully, a very significant rate or increase in the rate of GDP growth. And that then leads to that then leads to even more investment. Thank you. So you got an accelerated because we've got a, an increase in the rate. Now we've got this accelerated investment. Okay. And then what happens, Megan? Investment is a component of and so AD will and so this goes all the way around again starts again so what can we say about the multiplier and the and the accelerator they they yeah they work in tandem with one another and they kind of one effect does what to the other it it sorry Mm, causes or you know backs up what's another word for that re n forces reinforces so one effect is reinforcing the other and then the cycle starts again Now, we've already said that the multiplier works in a kind of positive and negative uh, way. So it works upwards and downwards. What, what say you to the, the accelerator? So we know it definitely goes positive. Do you think it goes, that works the other way as well? Reverse, kind of reverse gear on the investment side of things? Yes, Sorry? decelerate so no you're absolutely right so in the same way as the multiplier works upwards and downwards the accelerator works downwards as well so when do you think and I, you only need to look around you at the moment when do you think that you'd have this kind of opposite effect in terms of investment right so in our economic cycle you're going to be talking about the recession because firms will definitely not be in, they might replace, but, right, okay. And then and that kind of reinforces the recessionary kind of um, forces, I suppose, in the economy. Yes. Most yeah. most don't, unfortunately. Yeah. Does that mean that if only we could predict recessions, we'd all be uh, we'd all be investing in stocks and shares at the right time and currencies at the right time and making fortunes. But sorry, carry on. I don't. We digress. Does that mean that some businesses, even though because you can't exactly predict a recession, that means they will think that it's going just going to go on for a lot longer than it is. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it was last night on Look North, at BBC Look North News, um, just before Chrissy Rouse's little section. Did you see that? Okay. Do you know who Chrissy Rouse is? Sorry, Chrissy, I don't know you. Anyway, they were talk they were interviewing a guy in the Lake District, and he had just, just before the pandemic struck, so he owns a hotel B&B, and I think he'd spent his... his parents whole life savings which had been willed to him that he'd inherited and he'd spent it all on expanding the premises kind of blown the lot on it and now you know it's a massive investment great example of just increasing your capacity from you know 
you've got four bedrooms in your hotel, now you've got 20 or something. So an increased capacity. And now it look as glo gloomy, isn't it? Didn't see it coming. So yeah, if only we could see these things coming. Unfortunately, the cycles, are they always the same sort of time between one another? No. Um, so yeah, really difficult to kind of predict the cycles. Some, some people often say that, oh, we saw this coming, but of course, in hindsight, it's always easy to look back and say, I saw it coming. Right, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to leave it there. That's it for the accelerator. Uh, bye for now. Uh, Alana, I hope you're watching this if you get back and uh, tune in later. Goodbye. <laughs>